waking up knowing there's a reason All my dreams come alive Life is for living with you I made my decision You lift us up, God You lift me up, fill my eyes with wonder Forever young in your love This freedom's untainted with you No moment is wasted See the sun See the sun now bursting through the clouds Black and white Turns the color all around All this new in the Savior I have found This is living now There's nothing like living with you This life you created, I choose See the sun now bursting through the cloud Black and white, turns the color all around All is new in the Savior I have found This is living now I'm going to shout it out
your presence is an open door. We want you, Lord, like never before. Your presence, your presence is an open door. season your grace has been enough and I'm believing the best is yet to come the cross before me my hope of things above and in you Jesus the best is yet to come your presence, your presence is an open door. We want you, Lord, like never before. Your presence is an open door. So come now, Lord, like never breakthrough this morning. Let's sing it out. Sing it out. I know breakthrough is coming by faith. I see a miracle. My God has made me a promise and he won't stop now. I know breakthrough is coming Promise any more stop now. 
second of every day, Jesus. We want you, God, more and more of you, God. Less and less of us, Jesus. We see a miracle in Jesus' name. By faith, oh God. In your presence is an open door. We want you, Lord, like never before. With your best voice, let's sing that out. Your presence is an open door, so come now, Lord, like never before, and so come now, Lord, like never before, and so come now, Lord. Like never before. That should be your prayer each and every day. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Good day. And I'm so glad to share with you God's Word. Thank you once again for welcoming us into your home, for opening your doors, shall I say, and, and inviting us into your presence. It's such an honor to share with you today God's Word and to be in your home. In fact, the fact that you have set aside this time, whatever day it might be, whatever time it might be, the fact that you set aside this time to tune in, you've actually opened the door for the presence of God. Because what we are talking about is from the Word of God. So once again, thank you. I greet you in that powerful name of Jesus. Now, the last time that we had spoken, I spoke to you about a chase and a chasing after God. We shared a little bit about how it should not be like an ebb and a flow, like how the waves of the sea are. No, but we said it must be constant. We spoke about a chasing after God, a, 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 a knowing God, a intimate knowing, not just knowing about God, but an intimate knowing God where I know his heartbeat, where we said, you, you remember the first taste that you had when you met Jesus, that the first experience that you had with Jesus? Well, then we spoke about continuing in that first experience with God, not the ebb and flow. We looked at Moses, and how Lord, uh, Moses said, Lord, that I may know you. We saw David, and we took his scripture, and where David says, As the deer pants after the water, so my soul pants after you. And we asked ourselves the question, Does my soul pant after God? Pant after knowing God? And then we saw how Paul said, I count everything as loss when I compare it to the worth of knowing God. We spoke about how we should be getting hungry and thirsty for God. To have a consistent, ever-increasing chasing after God. So we spoke about the chase. Well, today I'm not going far from that. I want to continue in that. And just for a title for today, we're saying, Better is one day in your courts. Because when we are in God's courts, we get to know him better. I'm taking my lesson today from Psalms chapter 84. And I love the Psalms. And I love how the men of God would have written it at that time. 
Psalms 84. Now, just a little bit of history behind when and why Psalms 84 was penned by the psalmist. It was, well, if you look at uh, reading Bible studies, you would find that this particular psalm was probably written by a Levite. Now, a bit of the history when this was written. This Levite would have served in the tabernacle, would have served in the temple of God, doing his duties in the temple, serving in the temple. But now, when the psalm was written, it's written at a time when he was barred, when he was no more allowed to go to the temple, when he was no more allowed to access God's house. Why? Because the king of Assyria at that time was conquering and destroying Judah. And then King Hezekiah, in response to that king and his threats, began selling off, began giving off the gold from the temple. And the temple was no more like what it was, and they could not go to the temple. Now, this psalm, where the psalmist is now expressing his deep longing to be in that sweet nearness with God in the temple. Now, before I read it, I took the scripture, and when I saw it, I kind of identified with the psalmist who wrote Psalms 84. Because I see myself being kind of barred from going into the temple of God. In this day and age where we are, and with what the pandemic has done throughout the world, we see ourselves sort of barred from entering the house of God. Sort of barred from doing the things that we so long to do in the presence of God. Kind of barred or obstructed from coming and meeting with God in his temple. Now, you might say, but we are the temple of God. Yes, I know we have our devotions. I know you have your time with God. But I'm talking about the fellowship we have when we come together corporately as the body of Christ and how different it is. Perhaps even where you're sitting in your home at the moment and you are listening to this sermon. It is a little bit different as to how it would have been had you been in church and watching and sitting live in church when the praise and worship goes on and you can lift your hand and say amen. But what I want to say to you this morning, that even though you may be sitting in your home and hearing this sermon, react the same way. Say amen. Tell your neighbor, wow, did you hear that? God bless you. Lift your hands. Praise God. And I'm sure even when you praised and worshipped God this morning, although you are watching the praise team on the screen, I trust that you have engaged in worship. Where you did not worry who was lounging next to you, but you lifted your hand when you needed to. You shouted amen when you needed to. You sang at the top of your voice, perhaps, when you enjoyed and to worship with God. That is what it should be like. But I kind of identified with the psalmist when he wrote this. So, as I start this morning, won't you open your Bible? Get a pen quickly if you didn't. Get a pencil. Get a notepad. Begin to make some marks in your Bible or in your notepad, wherever. But get ready. Get ready. Now, it's Psalms chapter 84. He says in verse 1, How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. I'll just read a few verses. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. I want to go back to verse 1 at the beginning. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. Let's analyze that a little bit. Now, when someone says, how lovely is your dwelling place, 
Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think he is asking a question. I don't think he is asking, how lovely is your dwelling place? No, it's not a question. And neither does he tell us how lovely the dwelling place of the Lord is. And do you know why he couldn't tell us? Because he could not. Because the dwelling place of the Lord, because the Lord's presence, because his house is so awesome. It's beyond description. It's inexpressible. Words are not enough to describe the presence of God. Words are not enough to describe being in God's presence. Words are not enough to describe being in God's presence. House. Therefore, he says, how lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. I said I wanted to, I, I, I'm identifying with the psalmist. Yes, with the pandemic and when we can't attend church as normal, is there a longing in your heart? Uh, are we missing the awesome presence. Are we missing the fellowship with God Almighty in the fashion of coming to church? I said earlier on, yes, you might have your quiet time, but there's something different when we come in corporate worship, coming to the house of God. Now, here's the psalmist who worked in the temple. He served in the temple. And now he is barred. Now he cannot go anymore because the temple is no more there. Ah, And he longed for it. He says, how lovely is your dwelling place. I want to say, even to me, the dwelling place of God, the presence of God, words are insufficient and inadequate to express what it feels like to be in God's presence. But the psalmist continues in verse 2. He says, my soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. He says his soul longs. Now, it's confirming something for me. Although the temple might have had a whole lot of ornaments, The temple might have had the golden candlesticks. The temple might have been adorned in gold. But I don't think he was yearning after the look of the temple. I don't think he was yearning after the furnishings in the temple. I don't think he was missing all the gold trimmings in the temple. Because he says here, my soul longs after. Everything within me longs after it. He wasn't talking about the beauty of the temple. He has now been denied the privilege of meeting with God. And therefore, his soul is crying out. Because something happens when we come together as a church corporately and we meet with God. He says, my soul is longing. He says, it even faints. Can you see how deep This is, this feeling is going way down within. He's talking about fainting. It's a deep longing. It's so deep. This longing is so desperate, it's causing him to faint. I mean, when I look at the Hebrew meaning of the faints in this particular scripture, he talks about being consumed away. He talks about being utterly destroyed. Can you see the psalmist feeling? Can you see the, uh, the, the, the psalmist state at this moment? He's actually being consumed away because he's being barred from entering the presence of God. He's being barred from meeting with God, being barred from having fellowship, corporate fellowship in the temple of God. It's so bad. It's causing him to faint. It's causing him to be consumed away and causing him to be utterly destroyed. Friends, I'm not sure if you find yourself in a similar position. 
Aren't you missing the corporate fellowship in the house of God? Has the king of Assyria come in and barred us from meeting in the presence of God, from meeting in the temple of God? Well, if that is so, that is how our soul should be crying out to God. You see, this fainting, this deep pain, this deep feeling shows the psalmist appetite for God. How much he wanted God. Not just for God's love, not just for God's provisions, but to be in God's presence. There's a difference between wanting from God, wanting provisions from God, and just wanting to be in his presence. Now this is what the psalmist was yearning after. A hunger, an appetite for God, which he says his soul was crying out. Because I believe nothing else can feed that except being in his presence. Years more, friends, he continues to say, my heart and my flesh cry out. Can you see the position of the psalmist at this time? When he says, my heart, my soul is crying out. You know, everything within him is longing to be in the house of God. Everything within him is longing to be in the presence of God. I want to challenge you, my friends, today. How do you feel? How are you now that you've been uh, not, not allowed to uh, enter the presence of God or, or meet like how we used to meet. How are you feeling right now? Yes, you might have your quiet times, which we must and we should. But the corporate meeting where we come together and have fellowship and meet with God. He says, my heart and my flesh cry out. This cry is not a joyful cry. <laughs> It's not a cry where he's excited. No. In fact, when you delve in and look at the meaning of cry in this scripture, it's a loud cry. It's a cry of anguish. It's comparable, and the same word here is used in Psalm 17, verse 1, where David says, uh, or, or where, when David's enemies were after him, and he, and he cried out, he said, God, hear my cry, my foes are after me. So what sort of a cry is it? A cry of anguish. And here's the psalmist here, using that same word of cry, saying, my heart and my soul cries out in anguish. For you, God. That shows the depth of his love. How we missing, how he was missing the fellowship with Almighty. Can we today say, my heart and my soul cries out for you. Oh, how lovely is your dwelling place, O oh Lord. So this must be our reason for following after God. This must be our reason for running after God. This must be our reason for chasing after God Almighty. Why? To be in His presence. To fellowship with Him. To acknowledge Him. To know Him more intimately. There must be a deep yearning to meet with Him. On a Sunday morning, because we're coming together in corporate fellowship, how am I coming? A deep yearning, a longing, a, an anguish in my soul because I can't. And therefore, when I got the opportunity, I make every effort to get there because my soul is in anguish without that communion with Almighty God. Are you with me this morning? The psalmist here loved the house of God. He loved the house of God because he loved the God of the house. He loved the house of God because from here we can see how much he loved the God of the house. Can I say that of myself this morning? That I love the house of God so much because I'm deeply in love with the God of the house. 
of the house. He says his heart and his flesh cried out. He didn't cry out for the altar. He didn't cry out for the golden candlesticks. He didn't cry out for all the furnishings in the temple. But no, he cried out for the living God. And he goes on to say, not just any God, but God Almighty. He says, the living God. He says, verse 2, my soul yearns, even faints. For the courts of the Lord, my heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Is that the reason why we will come into church? Is that the reason why you and I will go to church? It should be. It should be because we want to meet with the living God. For no other reason but to meet and fellowship with the living God. Because just like Moses, we want to say that I am may know you. Here's the one that I found so not amusing, but very exciting. Verse 3 says, Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may come and have her young, a place near your altar, almighty O oh Lord Almighty, my King and my God. I don't know if he felt the same way, but I felt kind of jealous of the sparrow. Kind of jealous of the swallow. And I think maybe the psalmist who wrote the psalm also felt jealous of the sparrow and felt jealous of the swallow. Because... The birds found a home in the house of God. The birds found a place in the house of God. The birds found a space in the house of God. The birds found a shelter in the house of God. The birds found some quietness in the house of God. And he says even the birds were blessed to be in the house of God. Of God. My friends, I wish we were the sparrows and the swallows. That even when we were barred through lockdown to come into the house of God, even the birds could have come and have fellowship. So I think he was kind of jealous because the birds found a place. Now I'm saying not necessarily the physical house of God, but the birds, the birds found a space. A place where they felt comfortable. A place they could make their home. A place where they could rest. Friends, God is the best, best place to find a home in. God is the best place to find a space in. God is the best place to find some refuge in. And that's what the birds did. Friends, this day, I urge you. Let there be a hunger and a thirst inside of you so you can find this place, this space, this quietness in God. It's so significant that the psalmist here uses the sparrow and he uses the swallow. He could have said eagle, you know. But the sparrow, I think, is one of the smallest birds. One of the most insignificant birds. But yet, no matter how insignificant and small this bird might have been, it found some peace in the house of God. So friends, even you this day, maybe some of us looking around us, we kind of feel insignificant in these times. Kind of feel like, you know, not as outspoken like the eagle flying up and everyone can see. But friends, the house of God has a place even for the insignificant. No matter how small you might think you are, there is a place and a space for you in the house of God. Because where Almighty is, He brings peace. Birds, if you look at them flying in the air, they kind of look restless. And the Bible says here, even the sparrow found a home and the swallow a nest. 
And nest is your place of comfort. You know, my, my space. You can find some my space in the presence of God. In his house, you can find a my place. Because when you're found in his house, worshiping him and praising him, then there's a peace within your heart. So even the restless can find their nest in the presence of God. The restless can find their nest in the house of God. See, there's a satisfaction that comes in the presence of God. A satisfaction like no other. A satisfaction that you can find nowhere else but in the presence of God. In fact, in the presence of God, you are guaranteed to find satisfaction. You are guaranteed to find peace. Because Almighty God is peace. And I like what he says here at the end of verse 3. He says, a place near your altar, Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Now when someone says, my King and my God, can you see a double my? My King and my God. I think in that double my, that my king, my God, it reflects how precious God was to the psalmist. How is God to you? Can you in your times with God say, my king and my God, how I long for your presence. My king and my God, how I miss being in your presence. My king and my God, how awesome to fellowship together in your house, in your presence. And then it goes on in verse 4, it says, Blessed are those who dwell in your house, for they are ever praising you. It's so good to dwell in the presence of God. So good to dwell in the house of God. He says here, blessed are those who dwell in the house of God. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. That's verse 5. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. It's meaning set on pilgrimage. What is it saying to us? That is your pilgrimage. You're chasing after God. He's saying here, you are blessed. When we find our strength in you, those who chase after you, those who go after you, are blessed after they follow God. See, chasing after God or setting on pilgrimage is following after God. It's going after God, observing God and his prescripts. That it what it means. So when we are used to coming to his presence, it will keep you in track to continue chasing after God. I want to go down to the end. And verse 10 says, better. Oh, wait, maybe just let, let, let me continue. Verse 5, blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on following after you whose hearts are set on observing what you have to say to us. Verse 6, and they pass through the valley of Baca. Now, the valley of Baca, yeah, when we go and study it, look at it further, it talks about a place where you cry and where you are sad. But it says, even though you may pass through that valley, when you're in the presence of God, it makes springs. They make, it, they make the place of Baca, they make the place of tears, they make a place of sheer sadness, they make it a place of springs of joy. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. Verse 7, they go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Hear my prayer, Lord Almighty. Listen to me, God of Jacob. Look on our shield, O God. Look with favor as your anointed one. And verse 10 says, better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your presence. Better is one day in your house than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Now, if you look at what he's saying here, he's saying, in my uh, analysis of what he's saying, nothing compares to being in God's temple. That's what he's saying. Nothing compares to being in God's house. 
Nothing compares to being in fellowship with other saints in the presence of God. Nothing compares to being with God in our personal devotions. Nothing compares to delighting in God with others. Nothing compares to corporate worship. Because our local church is now known as the temple of God. This is now the temple of God. The local church. In the old days, the tabernacle, when the, um, uh, when the psalmist was writing, it was the temple at that time. Now, your local church, where you attend, that is the temple of God. And together, how marvelous it is to come and celebrate in the presence of God. You see, what the psalmist says now in the psalms that we just read, he talks about how he longs to be near God. The nearness, the sweet nearness of God. Just learning about God. Not just hearing about Someone else's intimate experience with God. Not just hearing about someone else's powerful experience with God. Not just hearing about someone else's uh, life-changing encounter with God. But coming yourself and myself into God's presence and experiencing God's presence for ourselves. That is what he was longing for. And you and I can have it. As we look forward, as a yearning within us to come into the presence of God. Where you have your personal encounter. Your personal experience. Your intimate experience with God Almighty in his presence. I want to be closing now, friends. But before I do, you know, we all hear about the pandemic and what it's done. The pandemic is coming and the physical attendance of church, in fact, before the pandemic, right across the world, the physical attendance of church was declining. But the pandemic sort of accelerated that decline. If you look at the world, the way the world works, the way you do work now, the way you go to work has changed. Many of you would stay at home and work the work the way you do work has changed. The way we shop has changed. You need not go to go physically to a clothing store to buy a shirt. You need not go to a store and buy a pair of shoes. No, the way you shop has changed. Because you can do it online. The way you get your food has changed. You need not go to KFC. You can call Mr. D. So the way you get your food has changed. That's what the pandemic has done. The way you get fit has changed. How do you keep fit now? There was a time when you couldn't go to the gym. So the way you keep fit has changed. Much of how we do school has changed. School is not normal. Like how it used to be, it has changed. So we have to perhaps adapt to the changing times. But God has not changed. Jesus has not changed. The purpose for the price he paid on Calvary has not changed changed. God's word has not changed. In fact, God's word says in Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth might pass away. Shopping might pass away. <laughs> Schools might go away. Heaven and earth might pass away, but my words will not pass away. The things that God requires of us has not changed. The Bible says, act justly. Love mercy. Walk humbly with your God. That's the word of God. Act justly. Love mercy. Walk humbly with your God. That has not changed. The way you work might have changed. The way you shop might have changed. 
The way you get your food might have changed. The way you keep fit might have changed. School has changed. But God's word has not changed. The things that God requires of us has not changed. The things that God desires for us has not changed. Changed. God says, seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. That has not changed. For you and I, there must still be a seeking after God. There must still be a chasing after God. Because although the world might have changed, that has not changed. Because we need to know God. And the only way you and I can know God is if we chase after him and we seek him and we seek him with all our hearts. God still wants to enjoy fellowship with you. Hear me? The world might have changed. Many things might have changed. But God still wants to enjoy fellowship with you. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 16. Oh, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. And I will be their God, and they will be my people. Can we say that that still stands today? Yes. God is still our God, and we are still his people. Things might have changed, but God's redemption plan has not changed. Things might have changed. The way we do things might have changed. But God's redemption plan, the reason why God came down to earth, has not changed. For he says, whomsoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That has not changed. But I have a problem. The Bible says in John 3, 16, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. The world still needs to hear this message. We cannot stop preaching it. We cannot stop sharing it. The world has to hear it. God's end time plan has not changed. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 52, it will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the trumpet, the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. Friends, that has not changed. The trumpet is going to be sounded. It will happen in the blink of an eye. The dead in Christ will rise up. And those who are living will be transformed. Friends, that has not changed. Jesus is coming soon. That has not changed. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. How wonderful, friends. No matter what might happen in the world, let's long for being in his presence. Because in his presence is when you get to know him. So we pray and we yearn after him. We worship him. We give him all. Because when you stay far from him, the, f the further you go away, the more we forget. The further we go away, the yearning goes away. But while the yearning is in there, continue being in the house of God. Continue worshiping. Continue lifting your hands. Continue praising him. Conti let your heart and your mind and everything within you long after him. Let everything within you yearn after him. Let everything within you cry out aloud for him. So much, the yearning must be so much that we might faint if we're not in his presence. God bless you today. Can I pray with you? Even as you and I ponder over this psalm that we have just gone over. 
my Father and my God. How we long to be in your presence. God, there's nothing better. There's nothing more wonderful. There's nothing more joyful than just being in your presence. Than just knowing you and experiencing you and encountering your presence. We thank you, God, for the psalm that we had read this day. We ask, oh God, that that same yearning be in us. That the same cry, God, be enveloped in us. That our souls will cry out for you. Because the best joy, the real peace comes when you, Father, are one with us. So we give you praise this morning. I pray, God, for every single child who's listening. Every single person who's hearing right now. I pray, God, for those that have this yearning in them. I pray, God, it will grow from strength to strength. That there will be no distractions. Even in the current environment we see in the world today. God, I pray there will be no distractions. But we will give in to having fellowship with you. We will give in to coming into your presence. We will give in, Father, to calling on your name and yearning after you. I pray this, Lord. We rebuke every work of the enemy. We rebuke every plan of the enemy, every plan that he has to stop us and prevent us and bar us from coming into your presence. We rebuke that in Jesus' name. Thank you for this day. Bless your people now, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I trust that you're encouraged. Just remember, it is all about Jesus. God bless you.